Hello and welcome to Dialogue. Today, I'll be joined by an old friend of Dialogue, a British scholar, Martin Jakes. His former senior fellow at the Department of Politics and International Studies at Cambridge University. We have a lot to cover today. The rapidly evolving situation in Afghanistan, the rivalry between China and the United States, and the still ravaging COVID-19 pandemic, and the questions about its origin. These are our topics. I'm Wang Guan. Over the past weeks, Taliban forces have taken control of Afghan territories at lightning speed. They have seized the presidential palace in Kabul as President Ghani fled the country. The Taliban's capture of Kabul and indeed of the whole country has been relatively peaceful as they have not encountered much resistance. So, uh, Martin, uh, let me go to you and pick your brain on this very important question. It is a fluid situation there. And it seems everyone uh, grossly underestimated just how quickly the country would fall to the Taliban and why it would fall to the Taliban. Um, what do you make of what's happening in the past 24 and 48 hours? Well, obviously, this has been a, an extraordinary uh, situation. Um, and what I think it reveals is really uh, the, how extraordinary little support uh, the United States actually enjoyed uh, in Afghanistan and likewise, of course, uh, it effectively its puppet government. I mean, you know, it, uh, it claps like a, like a, a house of cards. Um, and uh, so 20 years, basically, for 20 years, American military force uh, has, has, has held the country in this position. And once the opportunity uh, arose uh, for the Taliban to resume ruling the country, that is what has happened. And I think the other side of the coin to this, you know, is that it's clear the Taliban does enjoy considerable support uh, in Afghanistan. We shouldn't be surprised by that. It's obvious that uh, that was the situation before and it's the situation now. Well, let's talk about the immediate cause, if you will, of this, you know, Taliban takeover of Afghanistan. Uh, former President Donald Trump criticized Joe Biden of being weak, uh, calling uh, the fall of uh, Afghanistan one of the worst defeats in the U.S. history. Um, do you blame Biden and his announcement of the complete U.S. troops withdrawal? Uh, well, I think that it's difficult to really simply blame Biden for the situation. I mean, this, this has been long in the making. I mean, uh, it ought to have been obvious to successive American presidents, uh, uh, starting, of course, with uh, the person who has prime responsibility, who George W. Bush, who, during his presidency that this all, all, all started. Uh, and all of them, oh, there must have been plenty of uh, evidence uh, uh, for Obama and for Trump, and now, of course, Biden, that this war wasn't working. But the truth is that no president had the courage uh, to do something about it. Um, I mean, this was an extraordinary miscalculation. You have to go back to 9-11 and the mood in America and the looking back on it now, although I personally felt this at the time, the extraordinary overreaction of the United States. First, Afghanistan, secondly, Iraq, to, you know, let's put the thing in context. I mean, Twin Towers was a disaster for America, but it was only two and a half thousand people who died. And yet, America's reaction was to uh, create chaos, effectively, and many, many deaths uh, in these two countries. Yeah, indeed. Uh, 20 years in Afghanistan, over $2 trillion spent, and hundreds of thousands of lives, uh, primarily Afghans, uh, being uh, lost. What are the biggest takeaways, the biggest lessons from the U.S. military intervention in Afghanistan? Uh, well, I think that uh, the, the, this period of uh, 20 years uh, since it all started uh, has been an absolute disaster. For, uh, in terms of American political uh, and military uh, leadership. Uh, I mean, they absolutely squandered 
uh, uh, the petition uh, that they had by simply misreading it. Uh, a fundamental misreading of the world 20 years ago in believing that American, uni, a American unipolar world uh, uh, would uh, survive indefinitely and America and this century would belong to the United States. This was the neoconservative orthodoxy and it was to some extent con consensual position in America and it was completely wrong. It was a total misreading of what was happening in the world. I mean, you know, it, un the world is unrecognizable today from how they thought it would be then. And uh, I think that this is very, very concerning for the United States because, you know, their leadership, the, the, the leadership they've shown, the way they have related to the world over the past 20 years has been a, hu a huge mistake, uh, a, a, an error of massive proportions, which has greatly reduced respect for the United States, undermined faith in America and America's word, made it much more likely that allies will not, well, pre previous allies or present allies uh, will support America in the way that they might have done otherwise, and you certainly used to do. So I think that this is a great, this, this era is a great tur turning point. Uh, America can never be the same again. And Let's can never be viewed Ray. and can, can never be viewed again in the same way by the rest of the world. So Martin, do you think, you know, given what's happening in Afghanistan, this will be a lessons learned for America's ruling elites? Uh, you know, after seeing all this, they will get to understand the limits of American interventionism. It's impossible for them not to at least acknowledge and hopefully learn from that question, from, from what's gone wrong, because it has been such a disastrous period in American history that uh, I think that uh, they will be more cautious about intervening. Uh, and, and the fact of the matter is, of course, that uh, uh, the, the, the worst periods of intervention were some time ago. I mean, that the actual initiative which led to it. Um, and it's been less true with Obama and, and also interestingly with Trump. Um, I mean, but Obama, of course, uh, uh, did uh, wobble around over Syria and did get and did make a major mistake over uh, 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 over Libya. Uh, but I think that. Probably, probably America will be now more cautious. I mean, Trump's position was different altogether. You know, Trump didn't really, uh, you know, he had a different foreign policy, not just towards China, but also towards American intervention. You know, he thought America, to some extent, should retreat into America, uh, unlike the, 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 the consensual position since 1945, 40, uh, five, which was that America should run the world. Um, so we'll see what happens, I mean, which way things move. But I think that this is so humiliating for the United States that uh, they're likely to be very cautious about getting their hands burnt again. But Boris Johnson, the British Prime Minister, seems to have assigned blame to Joe Biden uh, earlier in the day when he was interviewed uh, on the situation of Afghanistan. He said, uh, you know, the sudden troops withdrawal, withdrawal announced by Biden contributed to the situation there. Do you think the cross-Atlantic solidarity will be there? Will all Western countries, you know, led by the U.S., be on the same page when recognizing the legitimacy of a future Taliban-led government? Uh, interesting question. Uh, I, I mean, I think that uh, Johnson, remember, uh, was really, uh, you know, it, it, his, his, his man was Trump and uh, not Biden. And he still got, and it's interesting, his reaction is to blame Biden. I mean, you know, I think Biden, at the end of the day, he didn't do it well, but at least he had the guts to get out and, you know, call a spade a spade, as it were. Um, uh, uh, the fact that he, that, that he, but I, it would have been very difficult to dress this situation up. up however they came out, actually, to be quite frank about it. All these people who are criticizing Biden, it was all done prematurely and so on. Come on now, you know, these American generals should own up to the fact that this was a disaster and they were party to this disaster. So you can't heap all the blame on Biden. 
when what Biden's done this year, when in fact it's 20 years uh, uh, in, in the making, in the creation. Um, what, what, how are the Western gov governments will react? I think probably they'll tend to move together on this. I mean, you know, there'll be outliers and so on. Um, the German government's position on things is always the most interesting in Europe, I think. Uh, usually the best of what we've got. And um, uh, we'll have to see. So talking about the situation in Afghanistan, how do you think, you know, the reemergence of the Taliban uh, will impact Joe Biden's political future in 2024 and also his Democratic Party's chances at the midterm elections in a year from now? Well, I think this is going to be a big problem for Biden. Um, as we know, uh, Biden is... Uh, 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 won the presidency in the context of uh, the, the, the four years of Trump. Uh, and uh, there's this huge cleavage now in American politics because basically the Republican Party is captive, has been captured by Trump. Uh, and we've got the congressional elections next year. I mean, there must be a strong chance anyway, short before all this, uh, that the Democrats would lose uh, one of one of the two houses uh, in these elections, and once that happens, then it'll be very mo much more difficult, as we know in American politics, for a president to carry through uh, their, and in Biden's case, particularly the economic program, ambitious economic program uh, that he has he has got, and then further into the future i mean you know what's going we're only three years away from the next presidential election could we see the return of trump could we see not if not the return of trump someone who is uh, uh, essentially trumpian uh, in their outlook so i think that uh, one of the biggest doubts and most worrying things elements of the situation in the world today is where america is going and, um, uh, and I think that uh, uh, American democracy is not safe. I think uh, it, it's now, it, it's, it, you know, it's, uh, there's a lot of doubt surrounding that and all the things that, you know, all the things that were said at, right at the end of Trump are true and haven't gone away, even though they're not being discussed with the same uh, anxiety and urgency as they were then. China has also spoken about the situation in Afghanistan. Uh, you may remember uh, Chinese State Councilor and Foreign Minister Wang Yi met with the Taliban leader in Tianjin not so long ago. What do you make of China's position uh, towards the Taliban? Well, I think that the Chinese position is, I broadly uh, concur with it. I mean, it seems to me that uh, uh, you know, Ch China can see that the Taliban is the overwhelmingly the most important representative uh, political uh, 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 organization in um, in Afghanistan, and that uh, it will be very important for China to have a positive relationship uh, with the new government, and it will be encouraging that new government to be inclusive, because the last thing China wants to see is elements of a civil war uh, in. Uh, Afghanistan and also it doesn't want to see which also would lend uh, 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 would, 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 would create the possibility of more terrorists operating uh, within uh, 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 Afghanistan and that would probably have implications for uh, China in the, in the context of uh, Xinjiang so I think that China will you know, we'll, 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 we'll be very anxious to have, to develop a positive dialogue with uh, the Taliban. And it seems to me that that started probably some time ago anyway. Uh, so I think that's the right approach. Let's shift gears a little bit, Martin, and talk about China-U.S. rivalry, which seems to have been escalating ever since we last uh, met, um, you know, in a world particularly now battered by COVID-19 and this Delta variant. The U.S. has been trying to unite its allies against China and, uh, you know, forming old ties in Southeast Asia, as it had ignored uh, during the previous administration. And adding on to that, it's, of course, the raging pandemic that presents a new propaganda battlefield, if you will, as the U.S. is now heavily pursuing the lab, uh, lab leak theory there. 
Um, you once expressed that the West is getting back to the old Cold War attitude. Um, do you think it is getting worse in the past year? And will anything stop it? I don't think it's got worse uh, over the last year. I think that the height of this was, uh, was last year, so far. Uh, I in, in 2020 because um, Trump was absolutely toxic, uh, uh, poisonous, uh, poisoned the atmosphere, uh, racist in his uh, racial innuendos towards China and the Chinese and so on. And I thought that that period, you know, rampant in his attacks on China economically, on in the tech war and so on. Uh, I think that that. That, that, that the sort of extremity, if you like, of uh, Trump has given way to something not dissimilar, but much more considered and much less uh, um, uh, uh, raucous uh, on, the, on the part uh, of Biden. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that we are now in a very different situation to the one we were in before 2016 and the election of Trump. And that is in America, the whole, uh, the, the ho basically, the consensual position, it's bipartisan, but it's more than bipartisan, it's consensual view of China, which it is now regard, it now regards it to be a threat to its position as the global hegemon. That is what underlies the great shift in American attitudes towards China. Before 2016, they didn't think that. Now they do think that. And this, therefore, is the beginning of a long period, in my view, of uh, a, a fairly conflictual relationship between the two countries. Yeah, there are many who argue that uh, you know the U.S.-China rivalry will not uh, will never get to a point uh, you know where the USSR and the U.S. got uh, during the height of the Cold War, because of the interconnectedness of U.S.-China in terms of trade and economic links. Um, do you share that optimism? Yeah, I, I think it's wrong to uh, call this a, a cold war. Uh, I mean, there are elements certainly in the attitudes uh, in the United States of that cold war period. There's no doubt about that. So therefore, the, the, you can see, you know, part of what we're witnessing is the return of a cold war mentality on the part of the United States. But that does not mean that it is a cold war. Uh, I think it's very different. The relationship is so different. I mean, you know, uh, America uh, uh, was always much stronger than the Soviet Union. Uh, the Soviet, uh, the two countries lived in total isolation from each other uh, in, 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 in their own blocks, their military, their military blocks and their, uh, their economic blocks. Um, and, uh, uh, and there was, and, and it was characterized by deep military rivalry. You know, the arms race, nuclear weapons, Cuban Missile Crisis, the Berlin War, the, the Berlin situation, and so on. So this is very different. Uh, th that era was very different from this one. I don't expect uh, there to be that, you know, sort of fundamental decoupling resulting eventually in the cleavage between the two countries so they live as in the pattern in the Cold War in two very different universes. I don't think that is going to happen. I think that what we're going to witness is, 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 is of course, across a broad uh, front, quite an acrimonious relationship between the two countries. Uh, everything's contested. Everything's made difficult. Um, uh, there'll be, uh, but primarily, I think it'll reduce itself, uh, in particular, to, uh, for example, the decoupling to high level tech, basically, though semiconductors and so on, uh, you know, the fear of, about Huawei uh, uh, and the rest of it, and a, a sort of race, if you like, uh, in, the, in the kind of commanding height uh, of high tech. But it won't just be that. I think that what we're witnessing is something. Uh, different in general, and that is, this is a contest between China and the United States for which modernity, the Chinese modernity or American modernity, will be most appropriate, most relevant, most successful in the 21st century. 
And that is not confined to one field. High tech is extremely important, but it's not just about that. Think about inclusivity. It's about uh, the quality of governance, extremely important, the quality of leadership. Um, it, 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 it's about um, uh, 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 the, the, the resilience of societies. This is what we've seen, for example, in the context uh, of the pandemic. So I think this is a very broad contest, and I would add this, and that is that, remember, the Cold War started with America actually going through a very creative phase, you know, and on top of the world and dominant. And this change now, since 2016, takes place in a totally different context. America has been on, on, in decline uh, since 1980, but especially since 2008. China has been on the rise ever since 1978. That's a very different context to the Cold War. Another point of great contention is COVID and its origins. Um, what do you make of Joe Biden's insistence, you know, asking its intelligence community to find the origin of COVID-19 and particularly probing a lab leak theory from China? Well, look, you see, COVID, is, COVID emerged in uh, the context of America's assault on China and Trump. And so from the word go, COVID was politicized beyond belief. Uh, it, you know, the period in January 2020, when there was this enormous assault on China for, you know, uh, secrecy, delay, lack of action, and so on, the kind of things that were said. And, um, and, uh, and that carried on, even when the, the pandemic finally, well, not finally, but two months later, in March, arrived in the West, in Europe and the United States. You know, then, then it, it was unabated, but it had a different meaning by this point. Uh, by this point, you know, they thought, but basically in January, I'd say that the, the, the Western attitude, the American attitude was, you know, uh, uh, China's messed up. This is a golden opportunity. By March and onwards, the situation was very different because China, it was what slow, steadily realizing was doing very well and the West was mishandling the whole uh, uh, pandemic. And so you had a new strategy, essentially, which has continued to this day, and that is a strategy of distraction and deflection. So that in the West, China's uh, performance is, is little, really little known about. It is not talked about. It, and on, on, yeah, great on the one sacrifices hand, were the made by the Chinese people. And on the other hand, a desperate attempt to discredit China over the origins of, of, the, of the pandemic. So this has been a huge kind of political and propaganda war again around COVID uh, to deflect from what are the realities of the situation, which is China's performed magnificently and the West has screwed up big time, especially the United States. But do you think people in the West, the ordinary folks, are you know, understanding what's happening in China when it comes to COVID control and prevention, the sacrifices that have been made by the people of China, uh, you know, versus how some of the societies in the West have coped with COVID? No, I don't. By and large, I don't. You've got to remember that what's happened here is virtually well, there are two things. First of all, China, during this recent period, since 2016, has become toxic. In other words, there is a attitudes towards China, and there's been a huge propaganda effort, uh, attitudes towards China have become far more negative. Uh, that's the first problem. Um, and the second problem is what I call, relatively speaking, uh, a kind of a lack would <laughs> put it politely a lack of reporting i mean put it extremely a news blackout on what china what's happening in china and how well china's done i mean they you know they just don't say they don't report it they just keep quiet and this is for example in my own country the uk this is across the across the media so uh, uh so there's huge ignorance about China. I mean, it does get reported, it just gets spoken about from time to time, but very little. And so people have a very false impression. 
And what do you make of the fact that you know uh, politicians are assigning blames for domestic uh, political purposes, while uh, poorer and uh, less developed countries are grappling with you know vaccinating their citizens? Because as we speak, uh, you know some of the richer countries in the war world possess you know over 70, 80 percent of the global vaccines, and the Delta variant is rampaging. Well, I, I, I'm very sorry to say that but I think that what's happened is very predictable. Um, I mean, the difficulty uh, of the rich world, the Western world, uh, is that uh, it doesn't understand uh, the problems of developing countries. It doesn't understand poverty. It doesn't understand uh, the imperatives uh, of development. Uh, it, it, is, it is fundamentally selfish. Uh, and 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 the, this this inability to relate, you know, it's a long time since the rich world world was poor, so it doesn't understand what those kind of problems are. So it doesn't show. It, 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 of course, there are people who, in, in the West, in for example, my own country, who would like to help, who have you, who have compassion, who have a desire uh, uh, to relate uh, to these countries. But overall, no, we're we're basically selfish. And the, the UK is a classic example of this. I mean, it's got so many, you know, it, 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 it was smart the way it moved into vaccines, um, but it's hoarded them. And, you know, it, it's now going to send some, but they're very little, you know. So the, 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 we've got a reservoir of vaccines, unused vaccines in this country. Uh, and we're sending a few, we'll be sending a few of them. Uh, this is, I'm afraid, this is a commentary on the attitude of the West towards develop the developing world. And of course, in the long run, this is a really serious problem for the West because the future, in my view, lies with the developing world. And China's relationship with the developing world is an acknowledgement of that this is the new axis of the future. Martin Jakes, always great to pick your brain. Thank you so much. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. And that will do it for this edition of Dialogue. I'm Wang Guan in Beijing. Thank you for watching.